Hello. Uh, my name is Feroz Mahmood. I'm from Boston. Where I'm the director of cardiac anesthesia at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this conference, particularly Dr. Bazad Mashri, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious conference for speaking on a rather difficult topic, and that is the best papers I've read the last year. He's implying that I read a lot of papers, but having said that, I was in a little bit of a conundrum of which papers specifically to select, but I chose one which is rather a technology-oriented paper and addresses a concept that is very near and dear to me and I believe it will be very important in the future. So uh, let's get started with the best paper I have read uh, in the last year. Enjoy. So let's get started uh, with the presentation of the best paper that I read in the last one year. I will start with my disclosures first. I am an educator and trainer for Abbott Structural Heart and at the same time a consultant for technology development for General Electric and uh, none of them have anything to do with the presentation that I'm uh, presenting right now and the slides are completely free of any commercial uh, products. So in real time, a clinical challenge during mitral valve surgery is the resolution of the mitral valve zone of coaptation. Now the zone of coaptation is referred to as the area or the region of the mitral leaflets where the leaflets oppose each other. It could also be referred to as a zone of apposition between the anterior and the posterior leaflet. While that's the starting and the end point of a lot of interventions, but it is something very hard to visualize in real time with echocardiography, particularly so in the operating room. Number one, because of the low line density and low resolution of the images. Number three is because sometimes the image quality is not that great to resolve and truly define the extent of apposition or the coaptation of both anterior and posterior leaflet across the anterolateral to posterior medial commissure. So that is a very real-time clinical challenge because that zone of coaptation forms the endpoint a lot of mitral valve repair techniques uh, both for degenerative as well as for uh, functional mitral regurgitation. So the paper I chose which is still uh, in press and not on PubMed right now at the, is being published in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery that is relates to the quantitative in vivo assessment of mitral valve coaptation area after undersized ring analoplasty repair for ischemic mitral regurgitation. That's a mouthful. But anyway, the group, uh, both uh, Robert and Joe Gorman and Dr. Michael Sachs are colleagues for which we have collaborated in the past in uh, a lot of NIH-related studies for uh, prediction of ischemic mitral regurgitation recurrence after mitral valve repair. And this is really a very credible group. It does a lot of high-end uh, mitral valve reconstruction and deconstruction and geometric analysis. And I've worked with them in the past, and the quality of the work that has been done in this paper is truly astounding and mind-boggling. And also, this is uh, important because uh, being collaborators for an NIH study, uh, our data sets were the ones that were used for uh, this uh, so the analysis and uh, assessment of mitral valve geometry in this uh, specific study. So why I specifically chose this paper? Uh, one of the most important reasons is the novel methodology. While it may appear to be uh, a rather a unique and a cumbersome and an offline methodology, but I assure you this is the first step towards getting it, this done in real time. And with the computational power of our echocardiography equipment getting better over time, this is more than likely to become mainstream in the short span of time. And because as within the audience, I'm sure there are people who have seen this geometric analysis that were once only part of some research analytical software published in by medical journals are now being uh, published as well as being, uh, you know, performed in real time in, 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 in the operating rooms. And a lot of high-end places are using these indices for intraoperative clinical decision making. And this also one of the major reasons for choosing this paper was that it addresses a very difficult problem, and that is the degree of apposition of the both anterior and posterior leaflets uh, in real time, because the degree of apposition and degree of coaptation between the two leaflets is kind of the structural mitral valve reserve, which allows the valve to get you know stretched, which allows the valve to get retracted, which compensates for the annular dilation because the zone of coaptation it gradually you know, gets exhausted as these remodeling changes happen. And eventually, when the coaptation zone is completely exhausted, the patient tends and, and ends up having mitral regurgitation. So zone of coaptation is important as the starting point of the knowledge of what the mitral valve reserve function is. And also, it is used as 
uh, as a broad and a, and, a, and a very qualitative marker of how good the quality of repair is because a greater degree of apposition between the leaflets implies that the mitral valve has more reserve or more structural reserve to sustain ischemia related or volume overload related structural remodeling and therefore uh, remain a dis um, remain functional and that is non regurgitant during systole and therefore this paper certainly has a lot of future implications for the way we assess uh, mitral valve geometry in the operating room and and the reason and the the perspective statement of this paper is important where they say that patient outcomes of regurgitant mitral valve remain, remain unpredictable. This is very poor. In one of the recent trials uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they found that at two years, almost 50% of the patients who had repair had recurrent MR after surgery. And that is due to an incomplete understanding of repair complexities and limitations of our echocardiographic imaging. We, we, can, we can do a lot of good things, but high resolution images to the point that we can actually define the degree of apposition and define the area of the overlap of these two leaflets is something that is that precludes us and something that we cannot do in the operating room reliably or at least not in a time efficient manner to allow us to make a good decision so therefore so we they, these uh, this group uh, applied an image based simulation technique to quantify the coaptation zone in a repaired mitral valve and demonstrated that that uh, you know uh, the, our common wisdom of increasing co zone of coaptation between two leaflets is not necessarily a uh, pre predictor of uh, competent repair and, and could essentially mean bad news also. So there is there's some lessons to be learned uh, with this paper, which I will go over in one second after. I want to go over the technique as well because that is an incredibly novel technique to do it. You know. So the objective of this study was to quantify patient-specific mitral valve coaptation behavior from clinical echocardiographic images obtained pre- and post repair to assess coaptation restoration and its relationship with long term durability. So, what, they, what we did was that they had these intraoperative echocardiographic three dimensional images that they used to assess the great degree of coaptation of leaflets after mitral valve repair and then followed up these patients for at least six months post operatively to see whether these patients had you know, uh, regurgitation or whether they had recurrent MR after ischemic mitral valve repair. So, the step one, what they had done initially was they took ovine uh, models of uh, mitral valve. They took fiduciary markers on the surface of the valve and let these valves be implanted in a pulse duplicator in a micro CT. And that was about eight or 10 mitral valves, uh, which was simply, uh, you know, an uh, experiment was done in an initial publication, which was their reference to develop a normal looking model of the mitral valve, which would mean that how would a mitral valve look in digital space. So with those fiduciary markers, they were able to define the surface geometry, the zone of coaptation, the annular behavior and displacement using ovine, uh, you know, mitral valves in a pulse duplicator uh, during systole and diastole. So that's step one. And, and forget about it because once we get down to the later uh, part of this uh, paper, we'll go over how this was applied to this specific study in which clinical data was used to define the geometry of the mitral valve. So Shape matching of the mitral valve was done was that we used a previously extant set of five in vitro ovine mitral valve meshes as the target geometries of shape matching. So being a bit complicated, but here's what it is. So freshly explanted ovine mitral valves are instrumented with about 100 fiducial markers uniformly distrib distributed over the full mitral valve surface area and installed into a pulsatile flow loop to mimic a healthy left ventricle. These mitral valves then imaged using micro CT scanner in both end diastole and end systole. So they found the mar matched or marked the behavior of these valves both at end systole and diastole. That is when the valve was completely open and the valve was completely closed. Now this data was processed to reconstruct the end diastolic leaflet geometry and the end systolic leaflet geometry and was reconstructed by iteratively building correspondence between the fiducial markers in two states with a hyperplastic fibro uh, with finite element framework. So essentially, they reconstructed the mitral valve based on these digital markers that was placed along the surface of the mitral valves uh, as well as the annulus and found how they reacted and how they behaved in N-Sicily as well as in N-Diastole. So in simplified, um, uh, the methodology of this uh, study was that they had 3D data sets of intraoperative mitral valve repairs for ischemic mitral regurgitation. They had a Cartesian export of both end systolic and end diastolic frames from this volumetric data set. 
which is imported into the MATLAB. And then there's further reconstruction of uh, the mitral valve surface topography that was based on these Cartesian coordinates. Then came the more complicated part where finite element modeling was performed to, to, to push the mitral valve from n systole to n, uh, from n diastole to n systole by application of digital force, and then led to finite element shape matching. And finally, the mitral valve was matched both digitally with the ovine models uh, uh, reconstruction that had been done initially uh, from a baseline study. And as a result of that, matching of mitral valve geometry with the ovine uh, you know, shapes that had been uh, pres uh, preserved as part of our reference method, the computation of the coaptation zone was performed. So this is kind of a simplified methodology they used. They had three data sets, Cartesian exports, went to MATLAB, then reconstructed the valve, then applied finite element modeling to put pressure on the valve from n diastole to n systole, then shape matched with the mitral valve from the basis of those digital reconstruction of those ovine models that had been created as a reference model for the shape of a mitral valve. And after that had been done, the zone of coaptation uh, was, was cr created and the area was calculated. So in essence, first the images were segmented and processed. Subsequent meshes were used as the inputs for our finite element based closure simulation. So mitral valve was initially closed by applying physiological loading and boundary conditions, but that technique results in an, sometimes an accurate representation, representation of true end systolic uh, stage of the mitral valve. And as a result, coaptation is, was, was, uh, was developed. Now, based on the reconstruction of the coaptation zone, and the generation of both end diastolic and end systolic volumes, they created uh, two uh, states. That is, uh, an interior uh, closed state and is an open state. And then the closed state, they were able to demonstrate the final shape of geometry, which was based on the a simulated model of mitral valve that was developed on the basis of normal anatomy of mitral valve from ovine models. But the key part of this thing is that they were able to trace and the simulation model was able to track the coaptation zone even beyond the point of coaptation which you normally do not even see with echocardiography so the the based on the artificial intelligence and the ability of the simulation to reconstruct based on the normal shape matching with the mitral valve the coaptation zone was not only created at the point of apposition but also the redundancy of the leaflets were defined that went and extended beyond the point of coaptation also so based on that, they defined the, 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 the two anterior and posterior leaflet. They defined a plane from which the coaptation zone started. This is the anterior leaflet coac contact region, and this is the posterior leaflet coaptation region, and this is the anterior leaflet redundant region. So this is the anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, this is the contact elements, and this is the redundant element, which you normally are unable to see with three-dimensional echocardiography because of poor resolution. Now, this has the, the, the common wisdom is that the more coaptation zone you have, the better the repair, because that's kind of the holy grail of all mitral valve repairs is that you are able to generate a greater apposition between leaflets, both anterior and posterior, and which implies the valve has more and a greater structural reserve, and it can sustain uh, geometric distortions. So the representative mitral valve you know, reconstructions demonstrated an open state, real-time three-dimensional echocardiography of the mitral valve with the endless and the free edge, closed state reconstruction and final simulated geometry was created and if you were to open the valves the leaflet demonstrated a significant coaptation zone both between the anterior and posterior leaflet as well as a redundant leaflet both and but and more so the anterior leaflet which extended beyond the plane of the of the mitral valve so however now let's get to the finding this is a very complicated set setup but paradoxically what they found was that in patients that developed recurrent ischemic mitral regurgitation after six months after undersizing annuloplasty repair, the contact area after immediately repair was actually greater than that of the patients who did not have recurrent mitral regurgitation in six months. Which means this is a paradoxical finding because this is what we essentially try to achieve when we are doing mitral valve repair is to create a greater apposition of leaflets so that we can have a greater zone of coaptation between them. Therefore, you have a greater mitral valve reserve and therefore, you have a greater tendency, a greater likelihood to sustain structural abnormalities and sustain structural distortions without becoming overtly dysfunctional and that's regurgitation.
So moreover, when they found that when normalized to total systolic leaflet area to account for general larger pre-surgical mitral valves in the recurrent group, the contact area increased more in the recurrent group compared to the non-recurrent group, which means they initially thought maybe this is because they had a greater contact area because there were larger valves, and therefore they were you know, making it look like that a larger area was associated with more rec recurrence simply because of a larger valve and a larger annulus. But even when they normalized this thing to the size of the valve and the height and the subaudi surface area, they found that there was a significant correlation with greater coaptation or more redundant leaflet and greater uh, you know, um, uh, recurrence of ischemic mitral regurgitation postoperatively. Now, this is a very, very interesting finding. And at the same time, they also tried to correlate the absolute mitral valve tenting area, which means the degree of tethering of the leaflets uh, with the uh, with the recurrence. As you can see in the in the study, the absolute mitral valve tent tenting area was higher, larger at baseline, that is pre-surgical, more had more tenting area than the than the non-recurrent mitral valves. But at the same time, this this difference disappeared after you know post-surgical, which means both of them had pretty much the same tenting as an, a non or, or insignificant. Uh, statistical uh, signif uh, statistical significance was not uh, uh, very very significant because it it was it, it demonstrated that both had the similar uh, mitral valve tenting area, so therefore they concluded that absolute mitral valve tenting area even pre-surgical does not necessarily reflect a more severe presentation of mitral regurgitation. Now these were contradictory results because we tend to believe that mitral valve tenting area is a very important prognostic indicator of what the chance of postoperative recurrence is. So this is again a very a paradoxical finding. It doesn't seem to make sense because it is it is something that we are taught otherwise. We think we are taught that the mitral valve regurgitation uh, is likely to uh, you know, uh, not likely to recur if the tenting area is large, and this one seems to have no correlation with, at all. You know, so now they gave it an explanation also, and they 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 said that these observations can be explained by the fact that all patients received approximately the same size anal plastering. So, they, of the fourteen patients that had this thing done, there was not a significant difference between the sizes of the rings that were applied. As a result, larger mitral valves ended up having a lot of redundant mitral valve. So similarly sized rings result in very similar post-surgical annular orifice area, which means regardless of what the pre-surgical annulus area was, post-surgical the annulus area ended up being the same. So therefore, recurrent mitral valves experience a larger percentage change in annular reduction postoperatively. But don't you think that's great? But it turns out, but they believe that consequently the recurrent mitral valves are likely much more tethered after repair than their non-recurrent counterparts, which may explain the suboptimal long-term outcomes. Now, long and short of this thing is, what they're trying to demonstrate is that by putting an annuloplasty ring, which is the same for both a dilated or a non-dilated annulus, what we have done is that we have created a, a more redundant leaflet, which is more susceptible to tethering, and therefore, more than likely that this leaflet was tethered, leading to more, more regurgitation. And the conclusion they could reach was, that the current study applied a simulation-based technique to recover the full mitral valve geometry for clinically obtained echocardiographic images, which demonstrated that contrary to expectations, increased mitral valve coaptation after undersized ring anuloplasty repair does not necessarily imply a more durable repair. What they are trying to say, and what I think the major conclusion is, that the, the continuation of the adverse LV remodeling that continues even after an undersized ring anuloplasty is not halted by an anuloplasty. And therefore, that adverse remodeling keeps playing its force, keeps retracting the leaflets, keeps tethering them to the point that they eventually become non-regurgitant and uh, become regurgitant and they lose the zone of coaptation. So therefore, ad adverse LV remodeling, aggravated leaflet tethering, and or advanced leaflet plasticity may play a larger role in the MR disease process, suggesting that mitral valve focused treatments may not lead to optimal outcomes. That's we commonly say that my under undersized ring annuloplasty is actually a valvular solution to what is an, a ventricular problem, and that seems to make sense. However, there are certain limitations of this study. There's only about 14 patients. But again, the, the methodology was, was incredible. The results are very saying a very strong association, and the results are very plausible. Now, we will extrapolate that to another study, which one of our uh, very, uh, uh, this is sort of, before I go there, let's get to the bottom line of the study, which, 
which is a visual abstract of the study where they say the question they wanted to answer was, does great post-surgical mitral valve leaflet coaptation area imply better durability? They answer the question is saying, no, it does not. And the surgical implications of the study are, coaptation area alone may not be a reliable target for repair durability, and in some patients, adverse remodeling, aggravated leaflet tethering, or advanced leaflet plasticity may play a larger role in the MR disease process. Therefore, patient-specific and LV and mitral valve integrated models are crucial for improved treatment planning. Now, I will take this a little further while this related to post-surgical or post-repair mitral valve assessment. We believe that the, impl the real implication of this study is that this is the first step to defining the zone of coaptation in real time. While this is being done post-acquisition, post but it's only a matter of time before this information, we could do it with AI and higher uh, computational power in the operating room in real time. So this is something that we have also worked in the past, and that is of assessment of risk of mitral regurgitation in non-regurgitant mitral valves in ischemic cardiomyopathy based on structural mitral valve reserve. As you can see, the non-regurgitant mitral valve is assumed normal, but take a look at these two mitral valves. So this valve is non-regurgitant, as is this valve. However, this valve has a higher you know, zone of coaptation, and therefore a larger mitral valve structural reserve to sustain structural demodeling, as opposed to this mitral valve, which has very limited reserve, and therefore, despite being non-regurgitant, this valve is much more likely to be, you know, to structurally fail and become regurgitant as opposed to this one. So therefore, non-regurgitation should not be implied as a normal valve because it really depends on the zone of coaptation and the degree of apposition of those both leaflets. And therefore, this is one of the studies uh, which is, uh, was presented in an abstract in European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery and is currently under review for uh, you know a publication. This is, the, we, we using three-dimensional TE data, structural mitral valve reserve was defined and compared between patients undergoing cabbage with no mitral regurgitation and with ischemic mitral regurgitation. We took the, you know, mitral valve was calculated, that is the, the zone of coaptation between both the anterior and posterior, uh, you know, leaflets. I'm not going to go into the detail of how we calculate it, but we calculated that in three zones, zone one being anterolateral, zone two being the middle one, and zone three being the posterior medial zone. And we found that, uh, that in, in these patients that the the non-regurgitant mitral, non -mitral, non -mitral, non mitral group had a larger mitral valve reserve than the IMR group in regions one and two, which means both zone one and zone two, the non-regurgitant mitral valves had a larger coaptation reserve than the regurgitant mitral valves. However, the reserve was comparable at the posteromedial portion of the valve, which is more than likely to fail in most patients, which means at A3 and P3 regions, even those patients who have non-regurgitant mitral valves and have ischemic cardiomyopathy, they are comparable pretty much as much reserve as a, no, as a regurgitant mitral valve had, which means this is one of the most uh, you know, susceptible re uh, regions of the mitral valve that is likely to fail when uh, the, the valve retracts or there's further L adverse LV remodeling. So for the, we concluded that non-regurgitant mitral valves vary in the risk of developing mitral regurgitation, and depletion of structural mitral reserve is a regional phenomenon with posteromedial portion of the non-regurgitant mitral valves with ischemic cardiomyopathy at most risk of coaptation failure with regional remodeling. So therefore, depletion of mitral valve reserve, this is the coaptation reserve, which is very difficult or almost impossible to calculate intraoperatively, is demonstrated by progressive posterior displacement of the coaptation point, which means the posterior leaflet gets retracted, the anterior leaflet tends to compensate for by stretching and lengthening, and therefore the coaptation zone or the coaptation point of coaptation between anterior and posterior leaflet, you know, is, is shifted progressively posteriorly. Therefore, valve structure and severity of regurgitation, the valves, the, the, the most important structural reserve is the coaptation reserve and, 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 and is the most important predictor of the likelihood of regurgitation, not only in those patients who have uh, you know, no mitral regurgitation as well as the ones in which we achieve you know, good coaptation, but the L adverse LV remodeling discontinues and therefore leading to valve failure and regurgitation. This is another paper which is we'll soon, uh, which has been accepted in a publication where we used, we tried to estimate that it is incredibly difficult to calculate this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, zone of coaptation in the operating room because it takes hours to calculate the lengths as well as the areas and of the of the coaptation zone in three zones. We tried to see that is there any specific echocardiographic parameter that matches the depletion of the coaptation zone, which means we could look at it and say. All right, if this 
echocardiographic parameter is present, that implies a progressive depletion of the zone of coaptation between these leaflets. And again, we found that zone 2, this is the A2, P2 region, has the most reserve in any mitral valve that presents for surgery, and zone 1 and zone 3 have less reserves. However, we believe and we found that both the tenting area and tenting height did not correlate with the coaptation zone as was shown in this uh, current study by the, by the group at uh, UPenn. And that, I believe, precisely is because the tenting area and tenting height represent a tomographic portion of the, of the topography of the valve. They are not representing the entire surface of the leaflet. It just represents one significant portion at A2 and P2 and ignores the degree of tenting or the degree of retraction of the leaflets at other regions. You know. However, most inter interestingly, what correlated most with the structural reserve was the tenting volume, which means an increase in tenting volume was related with negative correlation with the structural reserve of the valve, which means as the tenting volume increased, there was progressive depletion of the coaptation reserve. And that's possibly because that, that the coaptation the reserve correlates more with the global uh, you know, topography of the valve, and tenting volume represents not a tomographic section, but the entire topography of the valve. So therefore, in conclusion, what I wanted to suggest here is that I'm glad and I'm proud to see that these indices of mitral valve remodeling are now being used and now being you know, applied for decision making in the operating room. And our studies, which are although retrospective in nature, the one that we presented in the first uh, from, the, from the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery was retrospective with a small number of patients, but it does imply that these geometric parameters can be used prognostically to predict the patients who can have of valve failure and recurrent regurgitation and make more plausible clinical decisions that are based on LV incorporating the left ventricle into the mitral decision making. Thank you very much.